Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is great to see so much interest and enthusiasm, uh, and a synergy such as this can continue to influence public policy as it should, because as the President just indicated, there are very, very few engineers and scientists that are elected to the ranks of the House or the United States Senate. And think of it as we transition into an innovation economy, into a clean energy agenda, into addressing emerging technologies, it's important to have a balance of perspective and an infusion of a lot of science and tech thinking. Uh, we are just down the, uh, the hallway here doing uh, some markups on bills with science and tech today. And the potential, the endless potential of embracing the intellectual capacity of this country means that we can create jobs, provide more, much, much uh, stronger solutions, and advance our society in, in immeasurable uh, means so as to uh, really make a profound difference. So I thank you for being here today to assemble uh, in a way that allows for you to express your thinking uh, and your concerns that will hopefully uh, trigger a, a sound response from uh, the Hill here, uh, from Congress and the administration. So I do want to thank everyone involved in this, NSF, uh, certainly uh, with their partnership, uh, ASME, uh, certainly as a mechanical engineer, I like uh, greeting you to the, uh, uh, to the House here, and uh, with the forces of IEEE and Discover Magazine. It's a good coming together. It's a good compilation of talent and skill set that enables you to now have a briefing such as this, which proves very, very useful. I think that, uh, you know, oftentimes some of these, these issue areas are so galactic and beyond the reach of everyday ordinary residents that we represent that it behooves us to bring this to, uh, sort of agenda to the forefront. Now, to the efforts at hand, uh, the President was kind enough to mention our bill, H.R. 3029, that was passed last year, uh, which was kind of a surprising stat for a freshman legislator. But um, it's fun to be able to come here, having served in, in my situation in the New York State Legislature for 25 years, and my last 15 of which were as energy chair. And then I left the legislative ranks to assume the President's CEO job of NYSERDA the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, which does cutting edge application, working with business sectors to make a difference in energy retrofitting, to make certain that we can move forward with, forward with basic research and R&D investments, to do the portfolio, the renewable portfolio opportunities in New York, where we're engaging renewable energy uh, to increase us to a threshold that is acceptable uh, in New York's thinking. So we had a lot of opportunity to develop public policy and to then program implement, which was fun to do, and then come here and work on legislation that uh, we believe speaks to our experience in New York State. I know that GE has been tremendous in, in helping us formulate some of our thinking uh, with the natural gas fed turbines. Um, I do want to point out, too, since we're talking about legislation, I believe Joseph Eves is somewhere in the room. Is he beyond? Okay. I just wanted to acknowledge Joseph as a coworker that serves the 21st Congressional District. He's our legislative director, does an outstanding job, and every chance I have to uh, share public sentiments on behalf of my staff, I do it because they are a great team. We've assembled a great team that really puts itself into the agenda of uh, public policy and progressive policy. Just a quick thought on H.R. 3029. You know, as we advance this situation of increasing the energy efficiency, the efficiency of combined cycle natural gas fed turbines, there are those who would just see it as a yawn. You know, well, okay, so you're trying to move it from what, 60% to 65%? Um, and that's where we in the technical areas of the House need to bring to people's attention the monumental improvements that that expresses. Just 1% of efficiency, for instance, is calculated to have a huge impact on the environment. Some 4.4 million tons of carbon dioxide emission that are avoided. Think of it. That's a monumental piece for environmental concerns. And we also have the corresponding effect with NOx and SOx and other particulates. So it's profound when it comes to the environment. It's also a very important economic issue since every bit of efficiency, if we go from 60 to 65 percent, it's calculated that we can save a billion dollars on fuel costs annually, that we can save $180 billion by the year 2040 for electricity costs. 
So all of these economic development uh, external benefits, the environmental concerns that are improved are a part of the ripple effect of legislation like this. So, and then also when we think about it, as those of us addressing policy for this country that can really make an impact on the global marketplace, this allows for value-added outcomes. It allows for the best of its kind product, which then translates into job creation in the United States. There is no bigger issue right now than jobs. Creating jobs, retaining jobs. Well, an improvement like this, again, embraces that intellect that is released from our academia every year. We want to put that to work in a meaningful way. We have R&D operations in many of the private and public sectors, at universities and businesses. We want to make certain that that talent is allowed to explode in a way that creates tremendous opportunities so that you have a value added in the product you're selling. You are cutting edge in the world race on competition with the turbine activity that we can address through legislation like this. And when you think of it, you come across all disciplines. You cut across those disciplines, be it a lab opportunity, be it construction, trades workers, and also with engineering and technician type activities that really refine the outcome and allow us to step back and know that we have done the most we can with the resources we have. So it's bills like this that enable us to put a practical spin onto the work that's done, partnering with industries so as to have the best advice from the front line of activity on improvements that need to be made. But I see efficiency, in closing I'll say this, I see efficiency as the fuel of choice. We need to reach the energy efficiency no matter what our supply mix and it needs to be diverse. And as we grow our dependency, as the President said, as Mr. Simmons said, as we grow our dependency on natural gas, which is currently at 20 percent of our generation mix, with new discoveries out there of new sources, it really behooves us to move forward aggressively with being as efficient as we can. We are gluttonously dependent on energy resources. We are the, one of the worst users in the world in terms of a gluttonous use of a precious commodity, no matter what that mix might be. So efficiency, energy efficiency should be seen as our fuel of choice so that we have that same sort of aggressive behavior as you would with, with you know, the mining of coal or the drilling for oil. You do it in, an, in a very aggressive way and you, and you mine and, and drill energy efficiency, as a, as, see it as a, a tangible, and then it becomes our fuel of choice and it creates a great mindset. Uh, the efficiency efforts have got to be part of our calculus. Uh, we have to reduce that demand side uh, in a way that is very meaningful and to be able to work in an industry that allows us now to be more efficient in natural gas fed uh, combined cycle turbines is a great opportunity. So enjoy your coming together today. Allow the synergy to really work, participate, and feed us the information that we need to have so to do the most intelligent policy reforms that we can do here on the Hill, especially in light of the very few engineers that we have in the mix. So uh, to the scientists and engineers out there who are thinking of public policy and, and elected ranks as a, as a pot potential professional path, do it. We need the technical advice, and I think uh, it's a great opportunity to really influence the outcomes that are driven here on the Hill that live, outlive us perhaps, and will continue to impact society in meaningful measure. Thank you so much, and it's great to see a room full of enthusiasts like this. Take care. I'm going to tell you about what I love, which is gas turbines. I don't care if you love it. I love it, so I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you why, explain why gas turbines, and in particular natural gas-powered gas turbines, are crucial to tackling the challenges that this nation has in energy and economic performance. So who's the Gas Turbine Association? It's basically the companies that make large gas turbines in the United States for power production and some of their uh, uh, suppliers. What we're really here to talk about is how do we get both climate change improvement and economic growth for the country? We need both, and we want to do both without sacrificing one from the other. So energy can come from uh, wind, 
It can come from natural gas, it can come from petroleum, it can come from geothermal or nuclear or coal or biosources. What's the solution? The answer is all of the above. And the, the, the companies that make up the Gas Turbine Association, the, the gas turbine supplies also build windmills and geothermal units and fuel cells and nuclear plants and coal plants. And so when I'm, I'm telling you why gas turbines are good, it's not just because we make gas turbines, because we're just as happy, frankly, to sell you windmills and nuclear plants and other things. The point is the only way the nation can, can get both climate change benefits and economic growth is to have a solution that, it, that encompasses all of this. So renewable standards for industry, Europeans have them, Australia have them, the U.S. does not yet have one in, in a unified national sense, different states do. Uh, the point of this uh, graph is that if you're talking about 2020, 2030, 2040, you're still talking about a few tens of percent of renewables in the energy mix, which means most of the energy has to come from a non-renewable source. Here is a chart I borrowed from MIT, and the horizontal axis is the hour of the day, so it's a 24-hour cycle starting at midnight going, going to midnight. And those colors, which I unfortunately can't see, are different supplies of energy. So at the bottom is nuclear, that gray band, and the nuclear plants, big plants, uh, very inexpensive to operate once they're built. They go base load all the time. The dark brown band that's the second from the bottom are big coal plants. Again, they're, they're uh, large plants. They're hard to turn on and off. Those run all the time for base load. In between them is a reddish band, which is wind. And uh, wind generally blows during the day, not at night. At the top, you have solar, and obviously the sun shines during the day, not at night. And then the little blue, dark blue in there is uh, water. And in general, people who, who own the water resources, the dams, generate more water power during the day when the demand's high, less at night to conserve the water. In between, you need a power source, an energy source, that you can turn on when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine to make up the difference, and that's this light blue natural gas. Now, this is a, a, a projection that MIT made for 2020. The heights of the bars are a function of the, the assumptions, but what isn't part of the assumption, independent of the assumption, is that, that all of these contributors to the nation's energy have to be there in 2020 and 2030. I would even go so far as to say during the lifetime of the people in this room, I would expect all of these to be part of the energy solution, although the proportions will change. But for the next couple of decades, the big question is, what do we do about energy that isn't solar energy during the day, isn't wind energy when the wind blows, complementary, And one answer is a gas turbine. This is a picture of a gas turbine. Uh, you have to be its mother to really love it. It's, it's a compressor, a combustor, and a turbine. It's a jet engine. I was told not to say that, but it's actually a jet engine. It's the same jet engine that pushes the airplanes that we got here on, except it's much more rugged, designed to go for 20 years, 24-7, and higher efficiency and weight isn't a very big factor where it is for the airplane. In fact, a large gas turbine for ground power weighs as much as a 747. They are very, very heavy devices. So that, that's all I'm going to say, except you got a shaft at the end, and on the shaft you put a big generator. So now let's talk about gas turbine power plants. I said you had a gas turbine. You fuel it with natural gas. You could fuel it with other things. You could fuel, fuel it with oil. You can actually fuel it with coal gas or industrial process waste. And we do all of that, but really we're here to talk about natural gas, which is, is the most uh, 
efficient and ecologically beneficial fuel, and a generator. So th this, this is a, called a simple cycle, gas turbine running a generator. These are compact units. Here are 1685 units, 1685 megawatt units set up uh, at a site. Generally, plants that run on natural gas also have oil backups, just in case the gas supply is interrupted. This is often a regulatory requirement depending upon the, the uh, location and what the gas is used for. So here's the simplest sort of plant. A more efficient plant is called combined cycle, where I have the gas turbine. Gas turbines, jet engines put out a lot of hot air. That's wasted energy. And so in a combined cycle plant, we take the hot air and we boil water with it. We make steam and put the steam through steam generators. So we capture more of that. That's the 60% uh, efficiency the congressman talked about. A combined cycle gas turbine power plant is the most efficient device humankind knows to turn thermal energy into power. It's more efficient than fuel cells. It's more efficient than nuclear plants. It's the highest efficiency thing we know how to do. Are there things on the horizon that might be more efficient? Well, sure. Things that don't exist are always better than things that do exist. But right now, we've had uh, 70 years of an immense investment in technology for gas turbines. We're now at 60%. Could we go to 65? Yeah, I think so. And I'm an optimist. I think we could go to 70 eventually. Let me say that on these combined cycle plants, the gas turbine is actually buried in here. It's fairly small. Uh, the exhaust system uh, is large, and the steam part is large. That's a 1,000 megawatt combined cycle plant with four gas turbines. It's the size and output of a large nuclear plant. Now, I said there are two kinds of plants. There are also two kinds of gas turbines. They're gas turbines that are engineered from the ground up for base load power, uh, heavy frame machines is the jargon. And these are as large as that one's 575 megawatts, which is a large city's power. And the, the height on that is, you see the, the break. I, I get up, I'm who am uh, somewhat diameter challenged. Don't, don't get up to the center line of that engine. So this is, this is a very large machine, and it's extremely efficient. The most efficient machines are these big frame machines. Another kind of machine is the one up top. That's called an aeroderivative because it started out life as a 747 engine design, uh, made a little more heavy duty. Uh, that's, the, the aeroderivatives have the advantage that they're extremely compact, and a 25 megawatt aeroderivative, including a generator, is a trailer. And it can go in an airplane and be put on site, and in eight hours you're making power. It's not as efficient as the large ones. It's not as uh, efficient as a combined cycle plant, but it turns on and off very quickly. So up top you see two aeroderivative engines, and the engines are actually the little thing at the bottom. Uh, and this is the uh, cleanup, in this case, for this site in uh, Southern California. At the bottom, you have the big frame machines in a combined cycle. So there's two kinds of plants, and there are two kinds of gas turbines that we use. Now, why do people use them? The answer is the same thing that <laughs> simulates much of what goes on here inside the Beltway and elsewhere is money. Gas turbines are the least expensive way of installing power. They're the least expensive in capital cost, in terms of buying the equipment, the least expensive in terms of the land you need to site it, and they're the least uh, expensive in terms of the water you need to keep the system cool. And so the result is that gas turbines are very inexpensive indeed because gas tends to be more expensive than coal. There's not much difference between the cost of electricity between gas turbines and coal, but there's a large difference in, in, in investment needed to put the plant up. Now, the, the nuclear plants are even more expensive. Uh, the wind and solar are more expensive still. These are all part of the mix. But you're talking about, with current technologies, these are very expensive plants indeed, and so they get reflected 
as very expensive energy, even though you can put uh, uh, taxes or require certain amounts of uh, renewables to be bought, that still dries up the cost of energy, and as a policy decision, you have to decide how much is, is enough and how much is too much. Why are gas turbines better? It's because gas is better. Just speaking theoretically, for each pound of gas, for each amount of energy, I make 1.7 times more CO2 if I burn coal than I burn gas, and oil's in between. And for those of you who remember any chemistry, remember I'm a professor, it's really simple, which is coal is pure carbon, so it all ends up as CO2, and, and gas and petroleum have hydrogen in there, so we get some of the energy from hydrogen. Plus, the gas plants are more efficient, so when you, when you add these together for real uh, machines, Here's the ratio of carbon dioxide per unit of energy. You see that the gas turbine power plants are about half that of, of coal and uh, at least 50% better than, than uh, oil. The message is if you have to burn fossil fuels and you care about the environment, you want to burn gas. If you care about capital investment and land usage and water usage, you want to use gas and gas turbines. And that's why this business, making gas turbines for power plants, as the gas turbines got better in the 80s, became a very big business indeed, and why many power producers now, whenever they can get the gas, uh, that is, site someplace with gas, go with gas turbine combined cycle. So here's, here's the summary, which is fossil fuels are needed for many decades. They're part of the baseload, baseload portfolio with renewables and nuclear. They're fill-ins for the intermittent times when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't burn. Uh, it gener CO natural gas generates the least amount of CO2. And as you'll hear in the next, next talk, we have an enormous domestic supply of natural gas. Uh, given I have natural gas, gas turbine power plants are the obvious way to do it. They're the most efficient energy conversion system in service anywhere on the planet. It's the lowest cost, fastest turn-on, turn-off time. That's why a lot of the aero derivatives get used for uh, coupling with uh, renewables. And the lowest emissions, we just talked about CO2, but uh, sulfur, oxides of sulfur and nitrogen are also there too. So the main message is gas turbines and natural gas are needed for a green future for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I'm willing to come back in 40 years and talk to you all and, and re-examine where we are there. So this is a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, ASME, uh, IEEE, and uh, Discover Magazine and uh, the National Science Foundation for organizing and sponsoring these events. I think this is a great opportunity for us to get together and learn a little bit about uh, in this particular topic of natural gas. And today, what I'm going to be talking to you is natural gas and gas hydrates. Uh, and you're going to be looking at how gas hydrates can be a potential unconventional resource for the future energy landscape. Uh, I'm with the Colorado School of Mines and the co-director for the Hydrate Center uh, at uh, CSM. Um, let's see here. Okay. Let me start by briefly talking to you in general about natural gas. Uh, we heard from the previous talk about how uh, natural gas is important and uh, it can be used for, uh, for generation of energy from gas turbines. Uh, natural gas plays a very critical component in the energy supply in the U.S. And if we look at the statistics for 2008, natural gas composed 24% of our energy portfolio. Of that 24%, that translates to about 23.2 TCF. That's trillions of cubic feet of gas that's consumed uh, in 2008. Of that, the U.S. produces on its own about 90% of it, about 20 TCF. And the rest is uh, a balance between the import and exports. If you were to look at it, the reserves of natural gas in the U.S., that total uh, amounts to about two, 200 45 TCFs, and then we put it in perspective of how much of the annual uses, usage of natural gas, that's, that's about 10 years worth of supply for natural gas. That combines 
uh, the conventional resources and the unconventional that composes of shale and coal bed methane uh, in that portfolio of the reserves for natural gas. And those are the numbers that I want you to keep in perspective, that 10 years of supply that we have of natural gas. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, <clears throat> gas hydrates. And I'm going to start up front and telling you what I want you to take away from this brief uh, talk that I'm going to give you. The three main points about gas hydrates are that, first, vast amount of natural gas, mostly methane, is stored in gas hydrate deposits. And then we will quantify that as we go through this talk. Second, there's a potential of gas hydrates that must be realized through continued research, exploration, recovery, and production. And third, gas hydrate as an unconventional agent resource can ensure the U.S.'s energy security. So these are the three main points that I hope that you will remember after uh, this brief presentation. So let me start by briefly telling you about what are gas hydrates. As some of you might not be aware, what are these structures, these compounds? Gas hydrates are formed by combining water, gas, at relatively high pressures and low temperatures. With those four ingredients, water molecules assemble to form these cage type of structures that in can encage the gas molecules and form these crystal structures. Um, Typical gases that form gas hydrates are methane. This is the most common one, but we have a large number of gases that also do that, such as ethane, propane, car carbon dioxide, and many other ones. One of the very unique properties of gas hydrates is that they can store very large amount of gases. If you were to consider a volume of a hydrate and I were to dissociate this volume of hydrate, you would end up with about 0.9 volumes of water. And 164 times the volume of that gas at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, the hydrates uh, are essentially physically, if you were to look at them, just like ice or snow, and typically we will refer to gas hydrates as a burning snowball, and that's what is represented here. Because of the large amount of gas that's trapped in the hydrates, it can sustain its own combustion. Now, you may have got familiar with hydrates from more recently what has happened in the Gulf of Mexico with the uh, oil leak and the deep water horizon well. Uh, one of the first strategies that was attempted in containment of the oil leak was a very large containment system, a 100-ton structure. And as you probably uh, heard from the news, uh, that was a failure due to the buildup of hydrates uh, on the top of this containment dome as they were lowering through uh, the sea uh, ocean to the uh, oil leak. Uh, to get a better perspective of what was actually happening uh, to clog that uh, dome, um, this is a picture of a set of experiments that were performed in our laboratories at the Colorado School of Mines. This is a water column, and you were bubbling gas through it, and you see the hydrates forming and accumulating uh, and creating large masses that essentially block uh, the flow of any fluids through it. Uh, in the latest uh, containment um, strategy that has been applied to contain the oil leak, you see that uh, part of it com uh, composes of injection of methanol. There are two dark lines that I'm sorry you cannot see through there, but those are injected in order to prevent the formation of gas hydrates. Those are what are the structures referring to the ice-like compounds formed with methane gas. So. This is one side of hydrates that it is problematic and oil and gas industry have to deal with all the time. And as you see, it is a very large issue uh, related to the oil spill and the oil containment of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico currently. But what I want to talk to you about, it is gas hydrates as a resource, gas hydrates as it is uh, abundant in nature. Uh, here we have a, 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 a map of the globe and the different areas uh, where hydrates have been either inferred or recovered. And as you see, those locations are spread throughout the globe. They are not in a specific concentrating in particular location. And you, if you will, hydrates in that way are democratic. Um, and uh, they are mostly found in the continental margins, uh, as you see along the coasts of many of the continents, and the Arctic permafrost. Uh, the, those are the locations of sites where 
uh, hydrates have been actually recovered and some production has been made of uh, recovering natural gas from these hydrate deposits. Uh, here in the north slope in Alaska, uh, off the coast of uh, Japan in the Nankai Trough, and uh, uh, a few years back off the coast of Vancouver in Canada at the Barclay Canyon. So let's put it in perspective into numbers of what this corresponds to, uh, the amount of gas hydrates uh, as energy uh, resource. If you were to look at it uh, in terms of carbons, how much carbon there is in the, in the reserves in the earth, we see that if we were to combine all together the fossil fuels, land, ocean, and atmosphere, we would see that that would not even be close to half to what is available in terms of carbon and gas hydrates. So the energy potential for the energy in hydrates, it is uh, very vast. It's at least twice as much as that in fossil fuels. Uh, to put that in numbers, uh, the most recent estimates is that there is 700,000 trillions of cubic feet of methane stored in gas hydrate deposits. Um, again, going back to how much the U.S. Is consumes of natural gas per year, that's about 23 TCFs. So this re represents over 1,000 years, uh, if you will, of supply for uh, energy, uh, just if we're considering the U.S. This pyramid corresponds to the resources of where they are placed and where they are available and how much. The Arctic contains uh, large deposits, and those are the most accessible, uh, followed by the marine uh, environments, uh, followed by the fracture muds and the undeformed muds. Uh, those are, as we go down the pyramid, the resources are much, much larger. However, they are much, also much, much harder to get to. I'm sorry, go back one. So these are some uh, pictures of uh, some gas hydrate samples that have been recovered, both in the permafrost and the oceanic uh, environments. Uh, as you see here, the hydrate are the white uh, uh, domains that you see in the sediments uh, that uh, this particular sample was recovered from the Malik field in Canada in 2005. This one from Alp Ebern, that's in the North Slope in Canada in 2007. As you see, there is a, the hydrates are uh, encrusted within these sediments. Uh, this is a sample of an oceanic hydrate and, uh, off the coast of India uh, and, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, these are the hydrate mounds that were found uh, near uh, the, off the coast of Vancouver in Canada. As you see, there are very large domains of hydrate deposits that, that are in there. So where are we in terms of exploration recovery of gas hydrates? Uh, not only the U.S., but many other nations are aggressively pursuing these resources. The U.S. has uh, been going through uh, exploration and proof of concept uh, uh, expeditions uh, for logging, and not only in Alaska and North, North, North Slope, but also in the Gulf of Mexico, where many of these uh, resources are also located. Um, Canada has performed a trial test uh, recently uh, with limit, limited production. Japan is the most aggressive country going after these resources and has plans of produ pro producing natural gas from gas hydrates in uh, five years. Um, as you imagine, Japan has, is very starved in uh, natural resources, so having a hydrate deposit right off of its coast, it is very attractive uh, proposition for Japan. India, China, South Korea, New Zealand, and Taiwan, and they all looking for how to um, exploit this uh, natural resource uh, and uh, having started programs and are very, very aggressive in looking forward to um, how to um, uh, extract and recover, uh, recover gas from gas hydrates. The U.S. has been involved in most of these programs to, to some extent, uh, and that's beneficial as uh, there is an international community that uh, uh, is moving forward in the development uh, of this uh, particular resource. Where we are and where we are going in terms of gas hydrates, uh, the present, uh, very recently, the uh, National Academy uh, has put out a report by the National Research Council uh, giving a very comprehensive study of the energy potential of methane hydrates in the U.S. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, the main conclusions that have come out of that particular report is that uh, these resources uh, to produce methane challenges do exist, uh, but none of those appear that are impossible to overcome. Um, in order for us to meet that production goal uh, of producing methane from methane hydrates, we require substantial national commitment and substantial support. Uh, this report also went more in more detail into specific areas where we need to make uh, uh, headways, uh, specifically in terms of production tests, uh, assessments of the hazards and environmental issues related to the production, on how methane hydrate may impact the uh, global environment, uh, better quantification of the resources, uh, and also oversight of the program management uh, for this particular uh, area uh, of uh, uh, research and exploration. NSF, the National Science Foundation, has been central in providing basic research over the years uh, for uh, gas hydrates. Um, most of current research and development for gas hydrates is through the Department of Energy. And just in this current fiscal year, 15 million has been appropriated for uh, RRD and methane hydrates. Uh, however, that's just a small fraction of what has been authorized that uh, for last year was uh, 50 million. Uh, there, has, uh, there is a, a methane hydrate advisory committee here in the US and that has recommended that in order for the US to remain a leader in this field, uh, it must uh, make significant investments in order to develop these resources. Other nations are way ahead than the US currently and are outspending the US by at least a factor of 10. Um, as currently is proposed, $70 million is proposed as funding for R&D of methane hydrates in the fiscal year 2011 and increased by 10 million uh, as we go uh, for the next five years. Uh, if there is adequate funding for methane hydrates, uh, with, we believe that we will be able to recover um, and produce uh, uh, natural gas from, ga from the Arctic gas hydrates. Those are the most accessible and, and easily to recover, followed by the marine hydrates, and also have a very good understanding how the environment may impact by gas hydrates. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my talk and uh, uh, be able to take any questions that you may have.